All right, it's good to see everyone here today. Rhonda's feeling a lot better than she was on Sunday, but she decided to stay in this morning and not weather the cold and just give herself another day of rest. And she's coming along a lot better than what she was. Um, and we have a few who are out of town, and we may have some who are um, ill, not able to be here today, and others are not aware of. So, before we begin, we are going to start in Daniel seven here shortly. But before we do that. Let's go to Heavenly Father in word of prayer, and Dan, would you mind directing mm -hmm. us that prayer? Our Father in Heaven, we come before Thee this morning through Thy Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ, and we ask Thee, Heavenly Father, to be with us in our study of Thy prophet Daniel and help us to uh, learn things from uh, this prophet that will help us better serve Thee. We ask the Heavenly Father to be with those of our number who are undergoing the sickness and we would ask that you would restore them to their full health so they can once again uh, be together with us in our worship service and, and have a better life. We pray Heavenly Father that you'll be with each and every one of us and help us as we learn things from my word to help us go out into the world and and take thy message to other people that you would be with us and and strengthen us in that endeavor and, and help us. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you'll be merciful unto us and when we realize that we have done things wrong and repent of them, we ask for thy forgiveness. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Checking our sound out real quick. All right, let's see. All right, let's turn to Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. All right, Daniel 7 steps us into a little bit more, uh, a passage with a little bit more difficulty. In, in trying to ascertain what it is that we're looking at. Um, in preparation for this, I came across a couple different views. When, when we start with the vision initially, and we get to the beginning of the explanation, we say, oh, okay, it's the succession of the kings you know, that would follow Nebuchadnezzar, in this case Belshazzar, and um, ultimately to Christ, but yet, there's one interesting section with a vision that, um, that in, in, or part of Daniel's vision, that um, scholars take a different view of. It's, it's interesting, and, and, and we'll, we'll look at that as we get to that point. But let's start in Daniel chapter 7, there in verse 1. And we're going to read down through verse 8, kind of get the, the first part of the, um, the, the vision mm -hmm. in here. And let's see. Miss Wilma, would you mind reading for us verses 1 and 2 of Daniel 7, please? In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and a vision of the head fall on his bed. Then he wrote down the dream, telling the main facts. Daniel stood saying, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were soaring up the great city. All right, Miss Rita, if you would, read for us verses 3 and 4. And four great beasts <clears throat> came up from the sea, each different from the other. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I watched till its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man, and a man's heart was given to it. Okay, Lance, five and six, please. And behold, another beast, the second, like to a bear, <clears throat> and it raised up itself on one side, and it had three ribs in the mouth of it, between the teeth of it, and <clears throat> they said thus unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I beheld, and lo, another, like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl, but the beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. Okay, Judy, seven and eight, please. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. 
It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. And there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking pompous words. Okay. All right, let's go back up to verse 1 now. You know, if you just close your eyes and use a little bit of imagination, it's a little bit scary. And imagine being Daniel seeing this. Well, let's start in verse 1 there and look at a couple of things here with this. First off, we're backing up in time a little bit as far as in, in the order um, the, the various uh, chapters as it is divided up first in Daniel. It was not written in progression, uh, in a chronological pro progression. For instance, the previous uh, two chapters back, we saw the end of Belshazzar's reign, and the previous chapter, we saw the beginning of Darius um, um, serving over that area there. But this one takes us back to the first year of whose reign? Belshazzar. Yeah, Belshazzar's reign there. And during this time period, Daniel had a dream. Now, you think about the, before now, the visions and dreams have been upon the part of the, the king, some of the person. But now, it's coming to Daniel. And so he wrote this down, telling the main facts about the dream there. So we notice there in verse 2, that as it begins, he saw four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. What sea is the great sea? Yeah, the Mediterranean Sea. And just imagine, if you've ever researched this on the Internet or just Google Mediterranean Sea, you'll find plenty of pictures of the banks of the sea and everything. And imagine, imagine standing there on the banks looking out over the water, and all of a sudden the four winds of heaven there causing a great stir within the sea. Okay. Well, verse number three there, how many beasts came up from the sea? Now, here we go with the beasts coming up out of the water. Okay. It's kind of a, a revealing process, if you would, with each one. And he clarifies in verse 3 that regarding the similarity, he says each was different from the other one. Each was different from the other one. So let's look at verse 4 there. Let's examine this first beast that came up from the waters there. He says the first was like a, a what type of creature? A lion. Yeah, like a lion, and he had eagle's wings. Okay, so imagine a lion, if you would. And now imagine the lion having eagle's wings attached to its back. And there in verse 4, what happened to the wings? They were plucked off. Yeah. yeah, the wings were plucked off the lion there, and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like what? Yeah, like a man. So imagine a lion there, and he comes up out of the water with the two eagle's wings. The eagle's wings are plucked off of him, and the lion is forced to stand up like a man. And he's given the heart of a man, okay? Which, interestingly enough, is reverse to what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. And in an odd sort of way. It's kind of reverse of what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. But that was real. And, of course, this right here is the vision. So, verse 5 there, we bring the second beast into the picture. And he says, suddenly, another beast, a second one, like what type of creature? Yeah, like a bear, he says there. He says it was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. You ever seen someone coming out of a restaurant? Well, I'll tell you this story. Years ago, years ago, um, we had we had several congregations back. Um, there was this fellow, one of the members of the congregation, he and his wife missed Bible class. He came for worship service. He walked in, he had his toothpick sticking, a toothpick sticking out of his mouth. I don't, I know where he's been. <laughs> he went down to a local restaurant. He went out for breakfast that morning. So you can always tell someone when they're done eating, either they've got a toothpick get some out of their mouth, um, or they got something stuck in their teeth. But when, when you look at this bear here, he had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth, much like he just finished devouring something. A mighty bear. And they said thus to it, Arise and devour much flesh. All right. That's the second one. But I look at the third, or continue now with verse 6 there. There was another, there was, this one was kind of like a leopard, it says there, which had on its back how many wings? Mm -hmm. All right, so now we have a leopard that looks kind of like a bird, um, 
has four wings of a bird, and the beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. Maybe why Daniel said that it looked like a leopard. Because normally a leopard doesn't have four heads and four wings. But kind of resembled a leopard there a little bit. And notice here, dominion was given to it. Right, so, so let's back up. I want to make sure we didn't miss something here. With the third beast, it says dominion was given to it. With the previous beast, it said arise, devour much flesh. And then when you go up to the first beast, what happened to it? It was made to stand like a man was given the heart of a man. Okay. Almost, uh, you look at that, not very, um, not very powerful. You know, not in comparison there to the other two. So verse 7 then. So he makes the point then that after I saw in the night's vision, there was a fourth beast. And how does he, what's the very next word he uses to describe this beast? Dreadful. Yeah, very, very dreadful beast and terrible. He says it was exceedingly strong in the New King James Version. Now let's break this down for a moment. What type of teeth did it have? Iron. It had iron teeth. All right, it was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. Now, each of the beasts had their time period of domination, with the exception of the first one, because it talks about being made to stand up <coughs> like a man was given the heart of the man. But the second beast and the third beast, they, they've gone out onto the land, you can kind of imagine, and now they're, one is devouring much flesh, and one is having great dominion, and now here's this fourth one here, and it came out, and its teeth was like iron, and it was devouring, it was breaking in pieces and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had how many horns? Ten, Ten horns. There's always got to be some specific number in these visions. All right, and there are two different ways, and we'll talk about this as we go farther into the explanation of these. Um, sometimes when you see a 10, it's 10, as in 1, 2, 3, 5, 7, 9, 10. Or it can be uh, a symbolic of something, or a representation of something. 7 typically referred to as complete. 6 is something that would be incomplete. You know, different things like that there. But he had 10 horns. So verse 8, he makes the point that I was considering the horns. Kind of imagine he was kind of looking at the horns for a moment. And all of a sudden, another horn, a little one, come up from among them. Before whom three of the first horns were what? Like yeah. yeah, so this vision's just getting interesting and interesting. Okay, so now the ten horns, three of them have been plucked out by the root there, and a little one has come up amongst them there. And there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and the mouth speaking pompous words. At this point, you wake up and grab your tongues. Because you figured you'd <laughs> eaten something that disagreed with you. But this was his vision. And unlike our dreams, of course, this vision was given by God with a point and purpose to it. Now, the questions we have to ask sometimes, and this is kind of what, what Daniel is going to struggle with here in a minute until the Lord explains it, is when you look at these visions and these prophecies, do we look at each individual point as being representative of something? Or are we looking at a general picture being painted to represent a general point? Okay. And in a little bit, we're going, to, we're going to look at one commentary in particular that makes a suggestion as to the representation of the ten individual horns. You know, you're breaking it down to the very, very literal. Um, and even looking here at the, the one that's the mouth there, or the, the one that's speaking pompous words. All right, any thoughts or comments about that? Gene. The, the word pompous is ordinarily used to describe someone who speaks without sense. Pompous. Yeah. So I was curious about the use of the pompous wor words here to describe the words that uh, that the uh, that were being spoken by the uh, small horn. Well, that, that's that's a good question. Let's see. The <coughs> King James version renders it. Great um, things. Yeah, great things there. And um, <coughs> let me just click on that for a moment. Jump over to our dictionary. The Hebrew word simply means um, huge, domineering, very great things. Um, and let's see, I've got another one, another dictionary here. Um, well, I guess that's all it has on it. In other words, always translated great and translated very. So when it says pompous, I think the idea there is more of just very, as it says, they're speaking great things. Arrogance is really what. Well, use the word domineering in one of the definitions. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. 
Uh, also, the English Standard Version renders it speaking great things as well. And the uh, American Standard Version will render it the same thing. Looks like the King James, the New King James is really the, I don't know how the American Standard Version up here, but you know, it's about the only one, or at least one of the ma main ones that renders it pompous was there. Sometimes, you know, if, if they think they know what the, the prophecy means or the vision means, where it's going to, sometimes it can affect a little bit the translation. Right. You know, well, here's what he's really talking about, so let's yeah. render it this way. Yeah. It kind of brings to mind maybe uh, a great orator uh, with a, a powerful person, you know, uh, using <laughs> big words or whatever. Yeah, exactly. And uh, But I don't know. I haven't uh, decided what the vision means. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Well, one thing I want to keep in mind here for just a moment is the order of things here. Just kind of just and this may not mean anything to the understanding of what we're talking about here. But what we see in the first section here, we're going to, we've, so far we have four parts of the vision. Okay, you've got the, the first beast, the second beast, the third beast, and the fourth beast. All right, now uh, let's step on to verse 9 for a moment, and we'll come back to what we're what we're building here. Let's start in verse 9 there, and Miss Rose, if you would, read for us verses, uh, read for us verses 9 and 10, please. I watched till the thrones were put in place, and, I, and the accident of the days in his left hand, and his garment was as white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was, his throne, fiery. His throne was fiery flame, and its wheels were burning in the fire. A very stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand, thousands, thousands, thousands and thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times, ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated, and the books were opened. Okay, and then let's do 11 and 12, please. I watched then because of the sound and the pompous words which the horn was speaking. I watched till the beast was slain, and its body destroyed and given to the burning flame. Uh, as for the rest of the beast, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. Okay. Did I skip a verse? No, no, you're okay. good. Yeah, that's good. Let's stop there for a moment and step back and, and kind of build on this picture here a little bit. All right, now, here we come to verse 9 there. And he, he made the point that I watched till thrones were put in place. So now we, we have a whole other scene that's beginning to be built. You've got these, these five, these four visions here. Now all of a sudden you've got the fifth one. And in this particular fifth region there, you have a series of thrones being, being established there. And who was seated in the throne? Ancient okay, the Ancient of Days. I'm going to put A-O-F-D. Ancient of Days. Now, his garment was what? White as snow. And the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. Now, we're going to go ahead and rule this. We're going to rule one option out here. This is not talking about the coming of Christ. Okay, That's going to come a little bit later in the vision here. We'll show that. So if, that's, if this is not talking about Jesus, who is this talking about? The Father. Exactly. This is talking about God the Father. Now, oh, here again, I don't want to get too much into the explanations here in just a moment, but this is a key thing. At this point, after all four of these, including the great fourth beast there, we now have God on his throne. Okay, And a fiery stream issues forth from before him, and a thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated and the books were opened, much like the scene in Revelation. You know, we talk about the, the, the throne of God. Let's rule one thing out, though. I don't think this is talking about judgment as far as the final judgment. But it would be talking about God's judgment. And we'll see that unfold over here in verses 11 and 12 there. Notice he says... He says, I watched then because of the sound of the pompous words right here, as this one was speaking, number four. He says, I watched till the beast was slain, 
and his body is destroyed and given to the burning flame. Okay? And then he says, as for the rest of the beasts, they, these four, had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. Okay. So, here we have these right here, and then now we have God the Father passing what what would tend, what seems to be judgment on these. Okay. The, the fourth uh, was slain and given to the burning flame. So his power was taken away and God's power ruled. It's, yeah, the judgment of God was over him. Right. The others, while their kingdom was taken away, they were allowed to live for a little time, you know, but yeah. Okay. So, in a minute, like I said, we'll get into the possible meanings and everything about this, but I want to kind of build the order here that here we have this 11 and 12, or 10 through 12, is talking about the Ancient of Days, the Heavenly Father judging, you know. And, and you know, but he's always stood in judgment over every nation that's always ruled. He's always been there to lift them up or to bring them down, to make them answer or to reward them for their actions and their deeds there. All right, any thoughts or any comments? Uh, one question. Yes. The three thrones. Yes. Mm -hmm. That would be the the Trinity. Is, is that right? That I threw, that I drew up here. Yeah. No, that's just me stopping at three. Oh, <laughs> well, they didn't say three. No. <laughs> <laughs> Let me go back. And make sure I didn't miss that. He says, "I watched till thrones were put in place, and the ancient of days were seated." Now, having said that, I'm not saying that for certain that that's not what he saw. He could have seen seated on the throne um, what we know to be the Son of God. You know, because at this point, Jesus hadn't come, so he wasn't right. technically the Son. Um, could have also been the Holy Spirit sitting up there. But, but the focus, though, is on the Ancient of Days. And I don't think it's talked about. The, the, the third one, the, the Son, it hasn't come into play yet. He's about to come into the picture. I just threw, just stopped at three because it says thrones plural. So it may be uh, that may be where you should have stopped though. At one. Think, think, thinking about it. No, oh, 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 at the three. Yeah, because the ancient of days could be referring to uh, people that God had <laughs> uh, put on earth to rule His children. Or it could be referring to God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, which were always there. They were the ancient. Paul talks about the uh, how the, um, Christ, the Rock, during the days when they were wandering in the wilderness, you know, led them. So I don't. Know. But, but but I think in the prophecy though, it's talking about although he uses thrones put in place, thrones plural. Right. It's talking about the ancient. I believe it would be the Father, okay. you know, the Heavenly Father. Uh, the, the one who, you know, judges all, at least in the, what we're looking at here, context of that. But, any, any thoughts about that? Okay. Well, let's build upon this a little bit farther now. Let's start in verse 13. And, Miss Karen, if you would, read for us verses 13 and 14. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, come with the clouds of heaven, and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting <coughs> dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed. Okay. All right, let's look at a couple things here with this now. So he's watching the night visions, and one like the Son of Man. All right, when Dan Daniel is being told this, he's seeing this um, given to him by God, there's no confusion of language here. You know, he, we understand what he's talking about when he says the Son of Man, because, first off, coming with the clouds of heavens, he came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Now, to him was given what? Dominion, dominion and glory. glory. Yeah, three things here was given to him. We have dominion, and then we have glory, 
That was last one. The kingdom. And kin and the kingdom. That's right. I'm going to say honor, but that's not right. <laughs> Dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and language should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. Okay, all of a sudden, there's a previous dream that now comes to mind that Nebuchadnezzar had. Okay, Remember, in that dream, Nebuchadnezzar saw a statue that represented the kingdoms that would follow him. And that statue was destroyed by a stone that was cut out of a mountain but not cut with hands, you know, not made with man's hands. And that stone represented a kingdom that would spread throughout the world there. Now, would it be reasonable in the course of uh, developing our understanding and the explanation is soon to follow, would it be reasonable to begin to think that it's talking about the same end, the same kingdom? I would think so. It's described in the same way. So. Exactly. It's described in the same way. Okay. <laughs> All right. So here we have it in our progression here, the order of division here. You had the first four beasts, and then judgment brought upon the beasts by the Ancient of Days. And then he saw the Son the of Man come down. And I want to emphasize the point then. Okay. He doesn't see this before any of these. He sees it <laughs> after the judgment is passed upon them. Okay. Any thoughts or any comments? Okay. Very interesting, isn't it? Uh, John? Yes, ma'am. I was noticing the fact that it's called him uh, Son of Man. Yes. And this being the Old Testament. Then he comes back, he goes into the New Testament and verifies this calling himself Son of Man. Yeah. And that's because his kingdom is future. I mean, it's, it's part of the prophecy. And... Well, because in this case, the point you think about, we, we, we call Jesus, we call Jesus, right? We saw the Son of God. But what's important is that he was also the Son of Man because he was born of a woman. And that clarifies him to be the, why, why he refers to himself as the Son of Man. Because every single person living on the face of the earth during the day that Jesus walked on the earth was the Son of Man. You know, some man had, you know, had the, the process conception that brought that person into being. But what makes Jesus different? Jesus, before he came to this earth, was not the Son of Man. He wasn't technically the Son of God, because he wasn't created by God. He was eternal with God. But when his spirit was born into a body, he then became the Son of Man and the Son of God. Which is really significant with the yeah. Old Testament. It is. It helps to tie, and this is the beauty of the prophecies. You know, they help to, to, to link it forward and just to confirm the word all the more. Which always gave me a fit. <laughs> I mean, it did until I... I had to mature into understanding uh, Son of Man. Yeah. It's... I mean, it's like, why do you want to say that? It just causes confusion, but I understand now that the whole, all the scripture has to be studied very meticulously <coughs> to begin to understand why things are said, like they're said, when they're said. Yeah, if you look at uh, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3, it brings this light to that verse where it talks about was that first spoken by the Lord and yeah. not confirmed to us by yeah, those, uh, who, heard those who heard him. Mm -hmm. uh, That's right. How can we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? And it's it's speaking of Christ there. It, and it was first spoken to us by the Lord mm -hmm. in prophecy and then was later uh, confirmed to us by those who heard him. Yep. Jesus himself bearing witness. Right. Yeah. That's right. And man being mankind. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Son of man. It, exactly. Because he was born of a woman. Mm -hmm. There's the there's the mankind aspect of it, and that's a good point there. Mm -hmm. Being born of a son of man would be son of mankind, born of a woman, son of God, brought about by God. Good point. All right. So that brings us down to verse. Uh, we're, let's start with verse 15, and the next section we're going to read will take us down to verse. 22 there will be a good stopping point. So, Miss <laughs> Betty, would you mind reading for us verses 15 and 16, please? Okay. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit within my body, and the vision of my head troubled me. And I came near to one of those who stood by and asked him the truth of all this, so that he told me and made, and made known to me the interpretation of these things. 
Okay, and Miss Pat, if you would read for 17 and 18. Those great beasts which are four are four kings which arise out of the earth, but the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Okay, and Miss Doris, would you mind reading 19 and 20, please? Then I wished to know the truth about the fourth beast which was different from all the others, exceedingly dreadful, with its teeth of iron and its nails of bronze, which devoured broken pieces and trampled, excuse me, trampled the residue with its teeth and the ten horns that were on its head and the other horns which came up before each three fell, <laughs> namely, that horn which had the eyes and the mouth, which spoke pompous words, whose appearance was greater than his fellows. Okay, and Jean 21 and 22, please. I was watching. And the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them. Until the ancient of days came and judgment was made in favor of the in favor of the saints of the Most High. And the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. Okay. Alrighty, let's back up now. <clears throat> yeah, we'll, we'll read more here in a minute, but let's go back to verse 15 and kind of look at this now. Alright, so here we have Daniel who was grieved in his spirit within his body because of the visions. They were troubled his head, troubled him there. So he came there to one of those who stood by. Now, we're talking about within the vision. Much like John, when he saw the, the vision contained in Revelation, he would ask the one standing by him, you know, questions. And so I don't think there was an actual person with Daniel there, you know, beside him in real life, but in the vision there was when he was standing there at the banks, looking at over the Mediterranean Sea, and he, he asked them, he was troubled about this, asked him, what's the truth of all this? So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of these things. So verse 17, he says, those great beasts which are four, are four what? Kings. Kings, exactly. So these, these four kings that would arise out of the earth. Okay, that's pretty straightforward. We saw that one coming, you know, based on the previous... Connect, the previous with the connection prophecy or interpretation of the dream there. So, then he says, but the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever and ever. That's the end. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's, that's basically the, what, the, what the dream meant, that, or the, the, the vision meant. These four or three, they were kings that would rise up, but when everything is said and done, the, the saints would receive the kingdom. And the saints are those who make up let me put the cat back on this. The saints there are the ones that make up the kingdom that the Son of Man was going to be reigning over. Okay? So, pretty simple, straightforward. But then he says in verse 19, then I wish to know the truth about the fourth beast. Alright, this was one section of this division that was really troubling Daniel. Okay? Because it was a horrible it was a dreadful beast, and he wanted to know more about the particulars of that one. So, he said there in verse 19, talking about the teeth of iron, nails of bronze, which devoured broken pieces and trampled the residue with his feet. Um, why do you think this scared, worried, if you would, Daniel? It was so much greater than the other three. It was just uh, out of place. Okay, all right. Um, do you think Daniel was worried for his people? Mm -hmm. yeah. Long term? Okay. Mm -hmm. Probably was. Probably was. Um, this is just so much different. Well, it says trampling the residue. Yeah. And it's snarling through there, devouring everything. And what was the residue of this uh, eating everything up? was trampled with his feet. You know, that, yep. that's pretty scary. It, it is. It is. Very scary. Um, any other thoughts? Well, one of these uh, horns 
had eyes and a mouth which spoke pompous words, whose appearance was greater than his fellows. That scared me. Yeah. To do anything. <laughs> For the horn of the monster to come up and right. yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Well, and one thing to remember, we are talking about he's focusing on this part of the vision. Okay, and that's at least I think it's significant. He's not going to agree with some of the interpretations we're about to read here, but I think it's significant. Dan. It had ten horns, right? Yes. And then three of those were pushed out. For yeah. one horn to come up with the eyes and the mouth. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. So three of those horns that were pushed out could have been the three previous kings. Well, we're, we're about to read. We're, we're, oh, okay. we're, we're going to read some suggestions on that. Not from inspired word, but right. we're going to look at a couple here. Um, but we'll, we'll do that here after, after we get through this section. All right, any thoughts so far? Yeah. All right. I'm yes. Mm -hmm. On the horns. So were there ten horns? Yes. Or a total of thirteen? No, just a total of eleven when everything said and done. Mm -hmm. You had ten, and of the, the ten horns, three of them were pulled out. Mm -hmm. And then one came up in place of them. So there were a total of eleven horns, but not all at once. The three were plucked out, and the <laughs> one came up that had the face of them, the eyes, and so forth. Okay, so answering the question, um, The number of horns. Yes. So 11 would be the answer. Sounds good to me. <laughs> that you're saying. That's what I'll put down the 11 horns. Horn. <laughs> yes. Oh, so. <laughs> yeah, there were 11 horns. Okay. <laughs> I wanted to agree with you, John. That's like pulling teeth, though. <laughs> yeah, it should be 11. Just spit it out. She's going to give that over. <laughs> this is it's kind of how many apostles were there. Well, there were 12. No, actually, there was. There was there, there actually four took yeah, yeah. fourteen. Yeah. Yeah. Because Matthias replaced Judas making technically thirteen and then Paul making fourteen. 14. Yeah. It so got warm. You say thirteen, you have to go back and say the original thirteen. Well, plus exactly. Yeah. Okay. <sighs> <laughs> okay, so let's keep going here. Look, what's your thought, John? <laughs> I look at verse twenty here now. All right, he's still he's building, he's kind of recapping this a little bit. Um, but what, what he's really focusing on now is that one horn that had eyes and a mouth and that spoke pompous words and his appearance was greater than his fellows. Okay? So you think about the, the, the seven horns that remain, this one is even greater. Okay. How's it hit? Okay. All right, let's look at a couple verses here and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull out of um I'm going to go ahead and pull a commentary out and read to you what he thinks about it, and then we'll take the rest of the chapter and see, see, just get some thoughts and opinions on it. So <coughs> verse 21 there, he says, I was watching when the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them. Now that, it's a little bit different. Remember, this is detailed about this guy right here, okay? And he said, making war against the saints and prevailing against them. Now, normally, whenever we use the word saints, who are we referring to? Christians. Christians, okay. Question. Who is this? You're not supposed to ask that yet. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to talk about it just a moment. It's the devil. I can tell you right off the bat, I don't know. But I'm not going to do that. We're going to consider a few things here. I'm voting for the devil. Okay. <laughs> All right, and so he says, until the Ancient of Days came. Okay, so remember the Ancient of Days. Not Judgment Day. We've already ruled that out. Okay? Basically, until when the Ancient of Days steps in and passes judgment on what's going on there. And the judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High, and the time came for the saints to possess the what? The kingdom. The kingdom. Okay. So if there's any, any importance to how this is laid out, what we're going to have to say is that the saints that this guy right here was prevailing against were not, I, I'm not going to say they were not Christians, but they were followers of God, God's people. Then the ancient of days passed judgment on the, the four, specifically the fourth one here in the context here, and the saints then possessed the what? Kingdom. Which kingdom? 
the kingdom he gave to the Son of Man. Okay. So let's stop there for a moment. I had a, a teacher back in college, and I was trying to find my, my notebook, and he actually made me at the house, I think, by that time. He took the position, and this seems to be a somewhat common religion among Protestants. Protestants believe that the, the horn that spoke pompous words was referring to the... Yeah. <laughs> to the Pope. To the Pope. So what I want to do is I'm going to put this in here. Let me find a good, a good verse to, um, to pull up for this. Let's go up to verse 11. Adam Clark really lays out an interesting... Um, give me a second here. Um, let's see. <clears throat> Make sure I can scroll through this without having to. I have to trust you to read that. Yeah, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's see here. Let me back up here. I want to get to where uh, um, where he really breaks us down into possibilities of who it could be. Oh, let's go back to Father. I'm sorry. Let's see. Matt Father. Okay, now I need to go back to verse 7 one more time. Okay, all right, so he says, After I saw this in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast dreadful and terrible and exceedingly strong. Now I'm going to switch over to the people on the internet so they can see this as well. If you'll look on the right hand side of the chart up here, this is Adam Clark's uh, comments on this. All right, we'll kind of go through this. Not in great detail, but there are certain things that I think I found was interesting at least. He said, this is allowed on all hands to be the Roman Empire. And we said that a while ago. Mm -hmm. okay, without, without a doubt. Dreadful, terrible, exceedingly strong, the devoured, break in pieces, stamp the residue that is the remains of the former kingdom with its feet. It reduced Macedon into a Roman province. Let me scroll this up. There we go right here. About 168 years for Christ, the kingdom of the Pergamos, about 133 years. Syria, about 65, and Egypt, about 13, 30 years before Christ. And besides the remains for of the Macedonian Empire, so do many other provinces and kingdoms. All right, so he talks about how much the Roman Empire expanded there. Now, it says, if the fourth beast was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, just talking about, here he goes even into the, to the governing manner of it, saying that not only in its republic from form of government, but also in power and greatness extent, it had ten horns. This is where it gets really interesting here. He breaks this down in, into to literal <coughs> references, okay? Now, notice he says, the ten kingdoms into which the Roman Empire was afterwards divided, Calumet, a source, says ten Syrian kings, and he finds them thus. Now, here are the ten kings that at least the source Calumet here that Adam Clark reads a uh, reference. Uh, lists ten different rulers there that he says represent, were the ten horns, or the ten rulers that the horns represented are of this particular region there. And so he makes the point that there, this is too much like forced work to get to that. There are different opinions concerning these ten kings, or rather which they would have constituted this division of the Roman Empire. And basically, he goes, and there are three divisions here that he looks at. No, there's ten, I'm sorry. Um, dealing with the Roman Senate, the Greeks, and Ravenna. And onward he goes down. We won't read all those. Anyway, so he takes a very look, literal look at this. Okay, so that being the case, it's an interesting explanation as to what the ten horns may have represented. But that doesn't yet answer the question about that one horn that came up, does it? All right, so let's keep going here with this. All right, no. So he says here in verse 8 there, and uh, before whom... Before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up. So here he says these were probably, it's a term he used, uh, these listed right here, including the state of Rome. Then he says the first was given to the Pope, Stephen II, by Pippin, King of France, A.D., about 775, and this constituted the Pope's temporal princes. The second was given to St. Peter by Charlemagne in 774. The third, the state of Rome, was vested in the Pope, both in spirituals and temporals, and confirmed to him by Louis the Pious. These were the three horns which were plucked up from the roots before the little horn. All right. And so anyway, he goes on with this, and he's taking the opinion here 
that intimating cutting and superintendence for the Pope calls themselves Epopos. I ain't gonna be able to read this right. Epopopos. Yeah, but who, who, who speaks Latin well? Yeah, <laughs> Episcopus Episcoporum. And I don't speak Latin well at all. But anyway, the point is, though, is he says it means the overseer of overseers. And about 606 BC, Pope Boniface the second? Yeah. The second. Declared himself the first universal pope. You know, gave himself that. And so he comes down then with this explanation. Um, and full of boasting, pretending to unlimited jurisdiction, binding and loosing at pleasure, promising to absolve from all sins, present, past, and future, threatening the sin. He's talking about everything there that the Pope did uh, within their power and authority there. That defining the, the pompousness, uh, the pompous words that were being placed. So, all right, long story short, let me come, let me, um, come back to what we're, come back to the main screen here for a moment. Anyway, he presents the idea that this was the Catholic Church. Okay. Now, the question I have about this, and Zerg takes a position as well, that the, 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 the one that was speaking Paul's words was the Pope and, and represents the Catholic Church. And it very well could be that. The problem I have with, it, with fully understanding that is in the order of the way the vision there was given, this is all happening before the Ancient of Days comes. He, even even the, the one horn that came out and, and was persecuting the saints, that happened before the Ancient of Days. All right? Let's come back down again there to verse 22 there. We'll show that. Uh, let me get just the Bible back up there. And so he says, I was watching and the same horn was making war against the saints in verse 21 and prevailing against them. And there in verse 22... We see clearly until the ancient of days came and judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High. So we, we saw all that, and that even took place before the Son of Man came onto the scene. The, you know, the ancient of days judging came before the Son of Man. Could yes. it be a, a second judging? Like uh, verse 22 referring to when God gave... Uh, like in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 when Christ was finally gave, given dominion mm -hmm. at, at the day of judgment over all. Could it be a second one? Uh, there could be uh, the Ancient of Days coming to make judgment in favor of the saints when he gave Jesus power and dominion over everything uh, which was referring to uh, being referred to in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 about verse 40 something. Right, we came, when Christ came to establish his kingdom, right. ascended to the right hand side of his father, reigned. But it's more or less talking about the second coming, when, when, Christ, uh, when Christ came at judgment day uh, and uh, made judgment in favor of the saints mm -hmm. of the Most High. Uh, that, that may be just an insert there of this, of this second judgment. I know that back, back then, during this time, mm -hmm. The Ancient of Days came and made judgment against these uh, rulers, these uh, right. four kings. Could this be a second? I don't, I don't think so. <laughs> the reason why I say that is because he's basically walking through the vision, right. going back up to verse 15. And, uh, and, and when you go back to the original vision, um, he says, um, then verse 13, I was watching in the night vision. No, let me back up. And but verse 9, I watched till thrones were put in place and the Ancient of Days came. And a fiery stream came forth from him. And then verse 11, I watched then because of the sound of the pompous words. I watched till the beast was slain and its body was destroyed. And then verse 13, I was watching the night vision and behold, one like Son of Man came. Okay. So, um, and then this part right here where he says, and the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom would tend to line up with the Son of Man coming and being given a kingdom and dominion over all of the earth. Right. Now, bear, bear in mind, I'm not saying this is absolutely the way it is. I'm just trying to reason through it myself, trying to see why, why don't I quite see it the other way. But It's like a decluttering. <laughs> <laughs> well, he had to ask about this one-fourth beast. He had to ask about that. Well, uh, who did he ask? 
the vice, whoever was standing by him in the vision. Okay. Yeah. Uh, in his first vision mm -hmm. with Nebuchadnezzar, mm -hmm. were there angels present? Mm, no. That was Daniel being given the interpretation, and he was telling Nebuchadnezzar the dream. This interpretation is coming inside the vision. Okay. I'm just wondering if, if there were uh, angels present here that he could ask questions of. I think to he, clarify. I, I think in the vision he was he was um, I think in the vision he was talking to an angel. Okay. Someone who's standing beside him. Somebody that would know yeah. how to explain to him what he wasn't understanding. Exactly. Okay. At least that's what I'm kind of taking. That's what I thought. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think the idea of a second judgment is is incorrect. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, judgment day will come one time. Right. I think uh, for the judging or the decision making appears is in the promise that Christ made that I will build my church and the gates of hell will not oh. repeat not prevail against it. So you had, a, you had permanent judgment there on anyone who did not believe and obey Christ. But that the actual execu ex execution of the judgment is delayed until the, to the final judgment. There's a decision yeah. made because of your behavior, but the judgment comes at one time. Right. The execution of that judgment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good way of wording it. Yeah. <clears throat> so I, I would agree with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and that's why I just... I know this is where I, I keep coming back to, and we'll read some more here in verse 23, but I want to go and share with you, because this seems to be a common common thought or understanding. Now, Matthew Henry, I started to look at his a little bit and ran out of, ran out of time. He, he apparently was going to take a little bit different thought, but he referenced that, you know, some view it as this, and he was going to put forth another suggestion there, and I didn't get around to completing the reading of that, um, Let's see here for just a moment if I if he will give us any help here at about verse twenty two there. I think I've got Matthew Henry's on here. Let's see Henry here it is. Um, well, let's see. He it probably would be better to go back up to uh, one more one more time. We'll go back up to verse um, to verse um, verse eight there for just a moment. Uh, let's see. All right, so. So he says, um, let me have to scroll down. He doesn't, Matthew Henry doesn't break this up in a nice verse-by-verse -verse fashion. There's a more of a, uh, this section is talking about this, and this section is talking about that. So let me come down here for a moment. Let's see. Here's his breakdown of the events. like, this feast had four heads upon Alexander's death. His conquests were divided among his four chiefs, and he gives those chiefs there. Dominion was given to this feast. It was given of God. Uh, the fourth feast was more fierce and formidable. And uh, let's see. Talk about some of the breakup there. And let's see. All right, see, come on down. And let's see. He says, the ten horns are then supposed to be ten kings that reign successfully in Syria. And then the little horn is Antiochus of uh, Epiphanes, the last of the ten, who by one means or another undermined three of the kings and got the government, etc. And let's see. Okay, so he doesn't go into much detail at this point. I think he does a little bit later. Anyway, the point, though, is that in the end, we're not told exactly it's funny, in Daniel's, inter in the interpretation he received, the explanation he received, it still leaves us wanting, mm -hmm. you know. But the important part about all this is what we just read in 22, and as we'll read a few more passages here, beginning in verse 23, is when everything is said and done, where does the story end? You know, and that's really what's, what's important about this. Any thoughts before we continue on reading here? Well, the, yeah. My first thought was it doesn't make any difference what all that means. Because you can go right to the conclusion of the matter. Yes. <laughs> so you can just take out all of that, <laughs> right? And it wouldn't make any difference. Yes. Right. The, that verse we read prior to this it summed it all up. Yeah. Uh, the ver that uh, what was it, verse seven or something? I can't remember exactly where it was. Right up here, he says. Um, but the, he says, 
Those great beasts which are four are four kings which rise out of the earth, but the saints of the Most High will receive, will, shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever and ever. Yeah, that's it. That's it. A that's more logical it. idea. <clears throat> I mean, that's all fine and good. Yeah. It doesn't, but it doesn't have a lot of meaning for us uh, in the year 2011. Right. But in the time of Christ, <clears throat> when uh, Daniel uh, was... Uh, mm, see, Daniel was only about 400 years before Jesus. Right. Something in that general order. Uh, the Jews uh, would have been able to clearly have seen the uh, uh, rise of Alexander the Great uh, and trace that, uh, historically speaking. Um, Alexander the Great didn't have to work very hard as, in, as they conquered all those places because the Lord gave him all those victories. Right. Uh, according to that, anyway. Um, that that the third the, uh, the first king I guess second king would be uh, victorious. He Alexander the Great only had an army, just a little dinky army, mm -hmm. anyway, uh, not very big. And um, but I would think that the the Jews, especially Jewish scholars, the rabbis, and so on, they could read those things. Um, and they would certainly recognize the kingdoms from Alexander and, and, and uh, how, the, how his empire was split up and, and uh, what happened to the Ptolemies and so on during the, the period when there was no revelation uh, and so on. All that leading to the expectation that the time for Jesus, the Messiah, to come was very near. The Son of Man. Yeah. yeah. So I, I view that as a... As a as something for them and we can just cut to the end. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's kind of like uh, We're almost there too. <laughs> the book of Revelation. It, it, it's the same way. Yeah. You know, it's apocalyptic writing that means something to the people it was written to but not so much that the people are reading their mail. Yeah. If this was, if this particular dream mm -hmm. is scary, then what's to come later in chapters 10 and 11 yeah. is even worse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, uh, and much harder to understand. Right. And, and, and I think the primary message is the security of God's people. Or ultimately, as you said, the end there, what would happen? Dan. One question. Verse 22 again. Mm -hmm. What kingdom are they going to possess? Is that talking about uh, the church or is that talking about heaven? I, I think it's the church. Okay. Because heaven would put it to uh, post-second judgment. Right, but if, if but if if the initial reading of the vision lines up with the dream of Nebuchadnezzar, then it's talking about the saints possessing the kingdom. Now, when Christ is ahead and we are His subjects, you know, and in that in that form or fashion, we serve as priests of a royal priesthood. Yeah, you know, this this is talking about this whole thing is talking about earthly kingdoms and earthly yes, power. Exactly. Until so, the Son of Man establishes His right. Yeah, and. and it basically has to do with earthly, yeah. Because that's where we are. Uh, we are possessing the kingdom of Christ now is yes. on earth. Uh, so all of these things are, are who has mm -hmm. dominion and whose kingdom is going to last forever and who's hidden. That's right. That's right. I would. Yeah. I was going to say also that you, you can see the apostles uh, again, uh, Paul and. and and the other apostles talking about in their preaching, going into the synagogues and talking about what Daniel had to say right. about this. And they'd be talking to people who'd be familiar with these these uh, things, and they would have uh, some degree of familiarity with the history as well, uh, if they if they were educated at least. Um, and they would use those to prove that Jesus was the Christ. Yes. Yeah. You can imagine Paul preaching to some of the synagogues, reading, reading from this, yeah. and breaking it down for the people. Yeah. Okay, any other thoughts or comments? John, is it too early to go into Revelation? Are you holding that? Well, and that's okay. I just want to. Know. Well, I hadn't actually planned to go there. That book's okay, locked well, we still. Go there yet. No, no, no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> actually, though, what is interesting is that. 
you see similar visions between the two. Mm -hmm. All right. But they're not identical, you know, but it's um, kind of a, a apocalyptic imagery. Typically, it's signifying a change, you know, and that's what we see. But what's your thought? I was just thinking of how we studied in Daniel 2, uh, you know, when Nebuchadnezzar had his dream and, and, mm -hmm. and he saw this image and the Roman Empire was so scary. Mm -hmm. And this, this uh, verse 19, I think it is, is a description of that particular vision again, and it proves out to be the Roman Empire because of that vision. Yeah. It, well, and that vision said there's a reference into Revelation uh, 13 and uh, mm -hmm. 1 and 2, and it fits <laughs> in perfectly. <laughs> that particular vision, I mean, it's, yeah. it's all just imagery. Well, what, some people, <laughs> and this was, this was another thought we really need to get into, some people view. Um, the the, the the tent horn and the and the uh, persecution being the, the Roman Catholic Church of course we said that others view that this persecution was brought about by uh, by the Roman Empire upon Christians and um, Revelation depending on how what position you take okay um, I'm trying to think of name um, Alex Ogden he takes he takes an early date approach as in 68 or 68 70 AD writing of it. And he believes that Revelation is basically promising uh, judgment upon those who rejected the apostles and the prophets. Okay? Whereas Homer Haley takes the 98 time period of writing of it and says that it's God's judgment on the Roman Empire and showing uh, the saints' victory over the Roman Empire, God delivering them from that. Um, that helps nothing with what you just said, but it came to mind and sounded good. Um, but but it, it could be, though, that may be where the similar, similarity exists. That... If he's talking about the Roman Empire here, not so much the, the, the papacy, but just the, the Roman Empire, even before Christ established the church, um, they were hard on the Jews, although they tolerated them to a point. It could be that that would link with the vision of Revelation as well. Well, anytime, politics always affects Christians. That's true. Politics, That's true. period, always affects Christians. I wish we were more involved, but we can't seem to handle that little job. <laughs> very well anyway. <laughs> okay, and I'm not trying to dodge a question. I, I see, no, I, I no. need to go back and look at that in more detail. I just think those three things have yeah. something very close in common. Well, Homer Haley does a good job with both because he, when he looks at Revelation and the visions, he, he really pulls a lot from the Old Testament writings. You know, the same, but now some, some people in who, who hold to um, uh, premillennialism hold to it very much so. You know, they, they see a direct tie between the two, and therefore Daniel's got to be talking about this, and therefore Revelation's talking about this, and it's, you know. There's too much contradiction. It's easy to see that in, yeah, you in have premillennialism to. when you get into the New Testament. Yeah. Okay, we're over. Any other comments at the end here? I say, yeah, if, if we live during the, during the days of the early Christians, then there would be a significant appreciation of the Roman Empire yes. as an evil empire because they controlled every aspect of their life. They uh, killed, they were uh, opposed to the Christians. Uh, but remember, too, that the Roman Empire failed. Yes. <clears throat> so, even if, even if this is speaking of the Roman Empire, we know historically beyond that that the Roman, Roman Empire did not continue. It fell. Mm -hmm. It did. Because of internal evil behavior. That's right. It was judged by God. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I think what let's do. Let's next week start at twenty three. Twenty three is just kind of a, a recapping of the of the vision, the final our discussion of that four beast there, um, and um, plan to have the questions ready. We'll or answered. We'll do those, but we'll take a little extra time and I'll, I'll delve a little bit deeper and see if we can find some other possibilities. And Miss um, Pat, kind of give thought to that, you know, similarity there with Revelation. So. Um, and for those who are watching online, if you've got any questions or comments, or you'd like to send us any information about this that you may have, you can send it to uh, send it to questions at seminalpointcfc.org. Seminal point spelled with an e, cfc.org. We'd love to hear from you about that. I appreciate everyone coming out today. And tonight at 7:30, the Scripture broadcast. Dell is out of town, and Brother Buxton is scheduled to sit with sit in with us tonight. So we'll have him sitting in Dell's spot. Uh, at 730 scripturewayorg 
Appreciate everyone coming, and if you would, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer, and Nancy, would you mind mm -hmm. leading us in that prayer? Heavenly Father, thank you for the time that we could spend together uh, studying from the book of Daniel and trying to learn some of the things that you've written for us and uh, provided for us to know. We're th always thankful, Heavenly Father, for opportunities to study the Scriptures. We're thankful for the Scriptures, and we're thankful for the intellect you've given to us that we can know and read and know and understand how we can serve thee in this life and how we might please thee. We ask thee to forgive us of our sins and be with us through the remainder of the day. And also watch over our children, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 You know, there are things.